You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 136 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, Cashel Company, and My New Horse. Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. Brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. Today, we are joined by listener Anne Louise Knox, who shares how the Winston Churchill Fellowship is allowing her to travel the world to learn more about off-track welfare. We catch up with makeover hopeful Dana Johnson and how her horse and her are coming along. We wrap the show with Amanda Tucker from New Vocations, where she shares her favorite bits for green horses and introduces our adoptable horse of the week. Stay tuned. And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Joy Orr in Detroit, Michigan. And this is Kristen Kovach bentley in Jamestown, New York, and you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Kristen, we are like actually hitting fall season. Like by the time this episode comes out, it is fall. The summer is done. The day is getting shorter. Yeah, like visibly so. Yeah. I know like, it's it's dark. I can start now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A family member was like, Oh, we are losing three minutes a day. I was like, Oh, well, that's depressing. <laughs> Why would you break it down into numbers like that? Yeah, I don't know. She reads the newspaper, I guess. I don't know. But you should stop. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Like I have my windows closed now so that you don't hear like every car driving by on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So you're welcome. But like I hear the leaves falling. Because we sort of live in the woods. So that's very nice. Like it sounds, sounds like, like a Hallmark movie peaceful. here. That sounds very yeah. demure. It's very demure. It's very nice. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I like have. this season. The problem is, is this season is like also the busiest time of year if you work for RRP. So that part kind of stinks because I can't really enjoy any of it. <laughs> but not very mindful, not very yeah. demure. No, I can see it out the window and that's about as good as it's gonna get. So yes. Yeah, I'm feeling the heat too. I still have to kind of put our itinerary together, listener meetups, all that good stuff. Keep following us on social media channels because that's where those details will be if you're listening to this. Like you should be listening to this. Have you ever noticed that with podcasts where it's like they'll address it as if people don't? Now that listeners I mean, know you the never know. Like, my brain. <laughs> some people might just skip ahead to the like the interview bits. So if you're here, skippers and you hear are missing us, out. Thank you. Thank you for coming along with me and Joy on our ride. Because we really like, we are kind of living like parallel horse lives again. We are. It's really starting to get eerie. (laughs) It is a little weird. (laughs) But okay. So you know what I also think about this too, is that like, if we are living it as weird as it is for us to be living it kind of simultaneously, like other people are too. So if you do listen (laughs) in to our, you know, conversational bits here in the beginning like and you are going through something similar like we see you we see you sure we hear you and we love you and we're living it (laughs) along with you so this feels like we're talking about something very mysterious and it's not that mysterious it's It's just not really (laughs) yeah just both of our horses are not as competitive as they used to be or like physically able to do what they used to be able to do and it's just a time of transition for us to kind of figure out like what does that mean? (laughs) You know, like, what are we doing? What am I doing? That's like a lot of times I'm like, what do I do now? Like backtracking for anyone who is new to the show. Hi, welcome. If you listen to any of our like May, June episodes, Chris and I really dive deep into like, oh, it's our like slow summer with our horses, not as many competitions. Well, for me, like none, I think I showed three times, but. And like the TLDR version of this. Right. Yeah. Is your horse has neck arthritis and my horse has lymphoma. <laughs> so yes. it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Like we were like really forced stuff. to slow yeah. down. Yeah. We were forced to slow down. And then we were very optimistic about, oh, this like slow summer of like not heavy goals, not heavy competition. The pressure is off the table. And then I guess I started spiraling maybe like mid July, early August of what am I doing? And I'm like, I'm putting. I go to the bar and I'm like, what should I do here? Like it's, it was very strange. And the closest thing I I can 
like align it to in my experiences is when I was an athlete in college and then I graduated and all of a sudden I was not an athlete. I was not showing up for 6 a.m. practice. I didn't have races. I had no expectation to perform at a certain level. And it was very confusing. It's like I was just pushed out of the nest and I was supposed to find a new identity. Well, that's kind of what the summer felt like not having those competition goals. Well, and like that is exactly why I think racehorses like a second career, right? Because like mm-hmm. that's the reality that faces them. And then you know, like now I think our horses are at an age where they're like, you know, we actually appreciate not working all the time. <laughs> you yes, know, but my like horse like is enjoying yeah. her semi-retired life. <laughs> right. So, you know, and like, yes, I know that the logical argument here is like, there's more than one way to enjoy your horse. And yes, I do enjoy just spending time with my horse. Mm -hmm. The issue here is the transition between like Mm -hmm. having goals and like having a plan and having a show schedule and having this and having that, and then getting to the point where you enjoy spending time with your horse. And this is not to say I don't, this is just to say like, I don't know how to structure my time and I don't know what I'm working towards And because as much as I enjoy like Oh, like, because I, I, you know, I really don't know. I don't know how long Jabber has. Like, he is Mm -hmm. maintaining on the steroid that he's on. I don't know. It might be just sort of a palliative thing at this point where, like, he lives on that until there's organ involvement and then he has to be put down. Like, that may be the reality that we're working with. And I don't know. That might be this winter. That might be three years from now. So, very hard to to think ahead. I mean, same. Like, (laughs) right. Exactly. Yeah. You have injuries. Right. Yeah. You have a progressive ish. Yeah, like and it affects them neurologically. So, right. you know, some days can be great. Like right now we're in a really good season where the shockwave therapy seems to be helping. The supplements we have are on for inflammation have been helping. Her diet's been good. The exercises we've been doing are more like PT almost for her versus heavy work. But the moment she starts tripping and like grazing becomes difficult or anything like that, like we have to look at quality of life and could that be this winter or could it be in five years? No one knows. So yeah, I think (laughs) it's very difficult to go. How do we go from like 100 down to zero? And it was almost too far of a pendulum swing. So I'm curious for you, you know, what are some goals that you're trying to set for yourself right now? Because for me, I think I'm just trying to almost better my tool belt of how to bring a horse along in a slower pace. And that's been interesting. I've been like more experimental with how I work with my horse because there's no pressure, but I'm curious what you've been doing. You know, and that's like, I don't, this is what I'm struggling with, right? Because, and this is something I think I'm going to sort of struggle with in general. Like I rode Shorty the other day. This is a weird transition, but I Mm -hmm. rode Shorty the other day and I was like, oh, like this horse is still green. I can play with this horse and I can hopefully ideally improve him, you know, and he'll Mm -hmm. improve me and we'll teach him things. And with Jobber, I'm like, okay, job, I would not call Jobber finished. I think he's as finished as I realistically am going to get him Mm -hmm. in his life and in his, you know, just like level of athletic ability and my level of knowledge. I think we've gone as far together as we're going to go, you know? So it's like, Without even without the lymphoma, you know, and the like sort of ticking time bomb that is a horse with cancer, it, I just was a little bit at an impasse for this year anyway, because I just was not sure what I wanted to achieve. So, yeah, I mean, it feels like this is like some like dramatic, like Kristen's lost. And it's like I am, but I also realize like it's still a privilege to have horses. So I'm just still mm-hmm. enjoying, <laughs> you know, going to the farm every day and and all that. I just am not 100% sure what my goals are. So now we're sort of like doing like, fun bucket list things. Like before he got a, another abscess, I was like, oh, we're going to do no bridle Friday. Like that's fun, you know, and just hack yeah. around with no bridle on, you know, and that's cool. Like I don't need to take that off property. Like that's a fun thing for us at home, you know? So like, just like little cool stuff where I'm like, oh, I've always wanted this. Like, what does my little inner 12 year old horse girl want to do? Let's do that. And that seems mm-hmm. like kind of a fun way to Structure I think it's a good way to look at it. Like I, I kind of felt the same way. Like I almost feel like I'm 13 again, working with my horse of, you know, what, what can we try and do that makes sense? And I've really been trying to learn more about biomechanics in a way I hadn't before. Ooh, I've always yeah. paid attention to it, but now it's like, it's critical, right? Like for my right. horse's welfare, I really need to understand biomechanics. So trying to find exercises and aids that really optimize the time we're together. And it's so interesting because 
Astrid moves very different after those exercises. Like she steps mm. under and she's mm. like almost like loosey goosey. Like she just finished a Pilates class. And then I always make time for play at the end now. So like just yesterday I had her in her side rein set. We keep it really loose so she can play. And she's really building confidence in how she's carrying herself. And I think that's been a huge help. But right after I'll strip everything off and I let her roll around in the dirt and then we play tag. Mm, that sounds fun. Yeah. So, but she just moves so different from the beginning to that. Yeah. And I'm now looking at different types of neck warmers as we get closer to winter, just to ensure she continues to be comfortable. But I really firmly believe if we don't build the muscle now, winter is going to be extremely difficult for her. And yeah. so it's kind of given me a new goal set that isn't competition heavy. Well, and that's kind of like, you know, if you're, there's a silver lining in this, it's helpful that you have, you know, like here are things you can do to improve your horse's quality of life oh. with this particular condition. And I think that's really good, you know, that you have things to work for and you can see differences. And I'm like sort of treading water, I think in my situation, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think there's a whole lot I can do really to stop and slow this, you know, like, I, you know, we have a great vet team, but like, but you know what they say yeah. stress is the worst of it. And I feel like what you do oh, for jobbers is yeah. alleviate a lot of stress for him and you this keep things fun and no one knows him better than you. So I think in a lot of ways live, you are doing those things. Yeah, that's true. That's a good way to look at it. He does live a pretty stress-free life. He just is out all the time being yeah. feral. So he gets to be a horse who just comes <laughs> yeah. into play sometimes. Like he's honestly probably like a nerd who works at and we love nerds on the show. That is not meant derogatory. I am one as well. I'll say we are nerds. We are huge nerds and horse girls. So it's a double whammy. But, you know, the, the types who are working in tech and they have like the fun offices that have like pickleball and stuff in there. Like he's got the positive work-life balance that everyone wants. Well, he lives with his favorite prey animal, which is the cows. So... Yeah, yeah, he gets to go beat up on them anytime he wants. So. He's living the dream. So really you're is. doing a lot for him. And yeah, I think it's just kind of a perspective change of... Yes, that's very much what I think we're dealing yeah. with. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Just a, wow. a summer of growth. <laughs> oh, it's just we been a grew. weird one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look at that. You learn something new all the time. And speaking of, we're going to learn a lot today. I'm very excited to learn about this uh, Winston Churchill Fellowship especially from a listener, which is great. And we have lots of more things. I'm very curious to hear what bits that Amanda Tucker uses for her green beans. But before we dive into all of that, we are going to hear from our premier sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products. This Nutritional Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. More and more horse owners are managing older horses. One of the best ways to care for the senior horse in your life is by prioritizing their digestive tract health. Older horses are less able to maintain a well-balanced microbiome and repair and replace damaged tissues. This can lead to an uptick in ulcers, colic, or free fecal water syndrome. Poor gastrointestinal health decreases the horse's ability to digest and absorb adequate nutrients. It also impacts the effectiveness of the immune system, leaving older horses less able to fight off diseases such as EPM. Adding a research-proven digestive supplement to your older horse's diet can help maintain a healthy GI tract and reduce the incidence of digestive issues. We recommend ProbioticWise to our customers with senior and geriatric horses. ProbioticWise contains the true probiotic Saccharomyces boulardii. Unlike other yeast-based probiotics, S. boulardii remains viable through the acid environment in the stomach. It supports the healing of damaged tissues, reduced inflammation, and the optimal digestion and absorption of nutrients. Furthermore, ProbioticWise contains fermentation metabolites that support a well-balanced microbiome. ProbioticWise is sold through your veterinarian, so ask your vet if ProbioticWise is right for your older horse. You can learn more about ProbioticWise at kppvet.com. Got questions about your feeding program? We can help. Email Karen at questions at kppusa.com or call us at 859-873-2974. 
And I am super excited to bring our next guest on. We have Anne Louise Knox, who we're going to call her Annie. That's what she goes by. And she's a listener of the show. I had a chance to meet her in person recently. It was such a treat. And she's telling me about how she is on this amazing fellowship opportunity. It's called the Winston Churchill Fellowship. And I was like, we have to get her on to talk about this with listeners because it's just such an important project. But also it shows that anyone can make a difference for horses, no matter where you stand. So I'd love to welcome to the show, Annie. Thank you, Joy. And thanks, Kristen. Thanks for joining us. So before we dive into this really cool project you're working on, I would love to get like the quick 60 seconds of like how you got involved with horses. I didn't grow up in a horsey family or a horsey area, but I sort of longed for a horse for a long time. And when I was, I think I was 19, I got my my Astrid. So she was a black oh. thoroughbred mare and a bit like you. That was sort of how I fell into off the track horses without sort of even intending to. And it went from there. I went and worked overseas for a while with dressage horses in Germany and then realised I probably couldn't afford to have my own horse if I worked as a groom. So I came back and studied to become a vet. And now I work with harness race horses as a vet. And now I've got a standard bread. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I'm, Team standard bread. Sorry. I know. <laughs> I, like, no need to say sorry because after riding Wes, I was like, oh, I think the next one has to be a standard. <laughs> like, oh. They're so dreamy. <laughs> oh, I love a scrappy underdog. <laughs> yes. So tell us a little bit. You're on a fellowship right now, traveling the world. Tell us a little bit about this fellowship and how you found it. Yeah. So this fellowship is amazing. I've known for a year now that it was happening and I still have to pinch myself because it just seems unreal that I'm over here doing this. So I found out about it. It just popped up on Facebook and I thought, oh, okay. It's called the Churchill Fellowship and it's part of the Winston Churchill Trust. So Winston Churchill, when he passed away, he wanted to leave a legacy that was this fellowship and it allows individuals to travel around the world and like gather information from other countries and bring it back to their country and sort of share it so that we're all sort of sharing global ideas. So the fellowship, they run them in Australia and in the UK and also in New Zealand. Um, So I would urge any of your listeners in those countries to have a look into it because the great thing about it is that what Winston Churchill wanted to do was offer something a little bit like a road scholarship but open to everybody. Like there's no academic requirement with it. It's open to everyone and completely wide open as far as ideas, topics. They are there to give you all the support and resources you need, but then complete freedom to do make of it what you will. So it's just, it's fabulous. What a cool opportunity. Like, yeah, Yeah. as you're describing this, I'm like, whoa, well, like, I know. And then I'm like, I don't don't feel smart enough to have any ideas, you know, to like, what would I want to you know, study, like, what would I want to work on? (laughs) I I felt ridiculous. Honestly, going in there, there were all these people with really highbrow, like societally important, you know, topics. And I was going in there to talk about horses and I thought they're not going to care, you know, but they're all about the diversity of ideas. And, you know, as long as you can explain why it's important and, you know, you have a purpose and some like a difference that you want to make, well, you know, they're, they're listening. So it's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. And I have just now in my tiny overworked brain made the connection that you and I have been emailing like on my oh, RRP right. yeah. hat. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I guess, yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Because you wanted to connect and, you know, discuss the thoroughbred makeover a little bit and like, you know, and I, what I'm yeah. seeing in this email that I was like, wait, I know I've talked to her before. <laughs> your emphasis on like the community development and education, like that's very much what RRP stands for. So I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, you know, yeah, we we kind of get like, I don't want to say overlooked. Like I think we're doing at RRP, we're doing like pretty critical work and work that's gotten a lot of, you know, acclaim in the media and in the industry, but it is, it falls outside of funding models because we don't have horses. So, you know, I always have like a soft spot for like more research-based and like experiential based study like this, you know, because that's more of what we're doing is trying to make a better world for the horses, not necessarily like always, like we don't have horses under our care, Yeah, you know, and you need all kinds, right? Like you need those organizations, but then you also need like kind of thought leaders too. So like, yeah, that's why this is And the advantage of those sort of thought leader type organizations is the sustainability. You know, if you're not trying to physically take care of 
a mass of horses. There's so much you can do. It's almost like that give a man a fish thing, you know, like right. if, if you're not mm-hmm. sort of burdened with trying to actually just physically take care of the horses, you can sort of spread so much information and education and support and all that sort of stuff because um like this you know horses are expensive but as individuals we horse people are pretty crazy and we'll go without a lot to like keep a horse Mm -hmm. so individuals taking care of horses can be quite sustainable but like organizations taking care of large numbers of horses it can be really difficult to sustain so that's why I think the ROP is amazing and and the community thing like I mean we have a lot of competition based incentives in Australia they're done really well but the thing with the RRP and makeover in particular you've somehow managed to create this competition incentive that just also has this huge like community basis and I don't know how you've done it and I'm hoping to learn when I go there and see it in reality but yeah it's it's incredible how you've managed to sort of work that magic yeah like I would love to take credit for that but I'm interested to see like (laughs) how you observe it you know and like what you think about it because you know some of it is like it it is just we've I think attracted the right people but yeah I'm like joy you've been there like it is Mm -hmm. the weirdly friendliest show and we don't know how we got here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, like what other outcomes, you know, out. like, like, like what are, what else are you like seeking to, you know, bring back to, you know, sort of implement in your, yeah. 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 So I'm looking at in my travel. So I've been to the UK and prior to coming here to the USA and I'm looking at a variety of different areas. So, you know, I've been meeting with people who are in like research and academia, people in straight welfare organisations, people in off the track specific organisations, people who are more involved in the education, like the human learning side of things. And, you know, like I'm trying to sort of gather ideas from all over because I'm interested in ways we can improve like the longer term outcomes of placement of horses in homes. So as I said, like the industry bodies in Australia and a lot of individuals are doing really hard work and a lot of good work placing horses in homes out of racing. But beyond that, I suspect that there's quite a high attrition rate. It's hard to gauge, of course, because, you know, it's hard to get the hard statistics beyond exit from racing. But just, you know, from being on the ground, being in the field, you know, you do hear of and meet a lot of people who are sort of having that struggle a little bit further along. So that's what I'm interested in, how we can sort of support and deliver horse and human education lifelong, well beyond sort of placement in a new home. And I'm really interested in how that can occur sort of organically through building communities, as well as more formal education. I'm interested in how that can also be used to help sort of gather information on what's happening further down the line. So that's sort of my general purpose. Oh, yeah, that's like, that's just fascinating, you know, to even to think about like, because, you know, like there's a lot of reasons I could speculate like why that's happening, but that is a kind of a tough one to tackle. Like, why do you have problems maybe five, 10 years down the road, you know, where you don't have those yeah. problems for those horses, you know, and that's, that we were sort of working on like a trickle up approach, you know, with the thoroughbred makeover of like, okay, if you've increased the value of them right off the track and increase what they can achieve in that first year, the concept is like, hopefully that all sort of catches up down the road, but it is hard to know. And that's, I think that's where the education piece comes in, right? It's like, okay, if someone knows like, okay, two years in, this is might be what you're dealing with. Like they're less likely to, you know, dump that horse at a sale or something like that, you know, where, yeah, that's yeah. I that's think a, a lot of us like reach a sort of a bit of a crossroads where we're sort of like we don't quite know what to do with this horse, and it can either go, you know, with just the right sort of intervention and help, it can be turned in a positive direction, or it can, you know, go into more of a downward spiral. So yeah, yeah, it's it's just having yeah. that support about. I'm curious too, like you know, in the U.S., like the standard breads, and this is you know a little stereotypical, but like. Generally speaking, the standard breads are easier to keep. You know, they're just better doers like than the thoroughbred. And this is not to say the thoroughbreds are harder to keep. That just that transition year can be really tough. And the standard breads, I think, are a little more approachable. But I also think then that they tend to get picked up by people that maybe didn't quite know what they were getting into with horse ownership in general or with a horse that was greener than they were expecting, you know, because the standard bread isn't generally ridden much on the track. Like they're just driven. So, like, I would be curious if that's a similar experience in Australia, like your harness horses are 
maybe easier to keep as a pet, but then you still run into some challenges, you know, with trying to make them into more of a sport horse. Yeah, very much so. And I think they're almost at a disadvantage compared to thoroughbreds because they've got this reputation that precedes them of being bomb-proof and good horses for, you know, anxious riders, people returning to riding, that sort of thing. And it's so much pressure to put on and off the track horse. And they rise to the, the occasion admirably, so many of them, but I almost feel like they get put into even more difficult situations than thoroughbreds do in a lot of circumstances because they're expected to to just adapt. Ooh, and that is and unfortunately, point. they're often marketed that way as well and promoted that way. Yeah. Oh, that's heavy. But like, also, I'm like, I'm guilty of that. Like the first day I got Wes, like I knew he had been ridden a handful of times. So I just like shimmied on bareback and a halter and was like, hey, he's a trainer, but he'll be fine. Like, and that was like retrospectively not the most fair thing to do to him. I <laughs> but like, I, I wouldn't have done that horse. with my thoroughbred. The first day I brought him <laughs> home, I would have been like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, I know. Yeah. It's- Everything I put on social media about my standard bread, you know, and it's always like, what an absolute angel he is because he is. Yeah, we're not helping. Time, I'm like, should I be perpetuating this, you know, myth that doesn't apply to all horses? But hmm. they do it. It's amazing. Yeah, but yeah, but unfortunately, also, I have seen a number of them going to homes with that expectation. And, you know, they're still horses, they're individuals, they're not all necessarily bomb proof. And so I have seen like a number of them then being handed on because they're not the horse that they've been sort of talked up to be yeah but again like I mean they're amazing horses and these are people with very good intentions and good capabilities and I've been in this situation myself as well where it's like I could probably do it I just don't have a clue about standard breaths (laughs) and with a bit of help and support and a bit of understanding of you know some of the differences that you're dealing with you know I probably could make a go of it and a lot of people probably could. So sometimes it can just be a matter of having that help and the education there just at the right time. I mean, the first standard bread I ever got, I had never met a standard bread before and I picked her up at a estate sale and the man selling her said, oh yeah, I've been doing stock work on her for years. So I just took her home and hopped on. And it was only when I was on her back, I realized she was looking at me like she had no idea what I was doing up there. Oh, no. And she was a 15 year old man. <laughs> and, um, and I was freaked out because I was used to thoroughbreds and She just didn't do anything. She didn't move. And I kept thinking, oh, she's going to explode. Like, she's just waiting to explode. And she wasn't. She's a standard. But because I'd never met one before, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. She's living her best life being pretty in the (laughs) paddock because she's gorgeous, (laughs) fortunately. But, you know, it was that situation where if I knew anyone who knew standard breads or, you know, I might have had a different (laughs) approach. (laughs) <laughs> and then my second standard bread that I got, again, I'd heard a little bit more about them, but I'd heard that they were, you know, these bomb-proof riding horses. And the one that I bought, I'd been told that she had been ridden throughout her racing career because her owner, a trainer, had been cross-training her under saddle. I, I didn't realise that her cross-training consisted of wearing blinkers and basically galloping up the side of a highway because, oh. you know, she... He didn't oh really gosh. want her walking, trotting or cantering. So she was, she was, didn't give, you know, a hoot about traffic of any sort, but being asked to walk or trot was just the end of the world for her. <laughs> oh, no. So again, I was in this situation where I'd been, you know, riding for decades, thought I knew what I was doing and encountered this new type of horse and I had no idea. So yeah, it just goes to show like they, you know, with a bit of help, we can probably make a go of it, but it need that help needs to be sort of timely and i think in a lot of cases it needs to be on the ground <laughs> yeah oh that's yeah. like a genius though yeah to like recognize that and you know be working on it so yeah <laughs> well that's right like with the rrp i really love the library of resources you've helped like cultivate for people who want to get a thoroughbred or have one and kind of get lost in the weeds because it is a different type of training and i think Andy, correct me if I'm wrong. I know we talked about it a little bit, but like from an outsider looking into the US, it looks like we all have, you know, trainers guiding us and there's all the support and then all this help. And we have these beautiful facilities, but most people don't have access to that. Like I would say the average rider learned some sort of backyard riding skill or had the trainer who quote unquote called themselves a trainer. And then as they got older, were able to get a trainer who's like, please stop doing the things that you're doing. And so there's a lot of us who like just grow up with the love of horses, but 
can't always afford the, you know, the $60,000 imported warm blood who's had all this backing done for it, or even, you know, domestic horses who have had that type of training. So you're going to gravitate to an off the track They're affordable, they're athletic, they're beautiful, they're versatile, but it's like a fixer upper house. There's a lot of things you got to uncover and re-educate. And without those stories and those that support system to kind of guide you along the way, it can get really overwhelming. So I love that you've made this kind of a, a mission to do, to bring home of learning from others, just to gather everything that you're learning from other people. Well, it was such an eye opener talking to you and getting to see around your barn and everything, Joy. And I really appreciate you taking the time to show me that and explain to me because, yeah, like you said, I did have this perception that everyone in the USA seems to have their thing together as far as riding. It seemed that everyone was just on this linear, you know, journey upwards with their horses. But I think that's just what my algorithm has been feeding me. <laughs> so to actually get oh, no. out, <laughs> get out and talk to Joy Social and find out. It's a lie. It's all a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's all a lie. But that's the thing. I mean, if you looked online, probably what's happening in Australia, you'd probably think the same thing. It's when you get out, you know, it's when you're out at the adjustment properties and you're talking to your farrier and your dentist. So, you know, those are the people who see a lot of the horses out there, the ones that you don't see online. And um, that's probably where you get a more realistic idea of what's happening. So, yeah, it was really good to to meet you, Joy, and have that sort of initiation into what it's like over here. Oh man, not. you should come to my place then. <laughs> That's the thing, it's Chris. And yours, is one of, yours is one of the most fun experiences I've ever had on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's not a horse, pre- like it's not a property designed for horses. Like it is, it, we just carve out an existence on a cattle ranch. So yeah, it is a, it's a good time. But Kristen, that's uh, why I love the uh, podcast so much. Like I was saying to Joy, there are a lot of podcasts that are really good, but I can only take in small doses because it's sort of overwhelming. Like it's very aspirational, but I feel like, my goodness, I'm still doing like the beginner lessons on ride IQ and I'm 46 years old and I'm starting again with a new horse. You know, whereas listening to retired racehorse radio, it's got it's got the aspirational stuff, but it's mixed up with the sort of real life stuff. And it's so honest. And, you know, listening the other week to, I think, was it Chris who was talking about sort of having to take a step back mm-hmm. with his horse just prior yes, to make yeah. over. And like to hear that from a professional. And, you know, it just it really means a lot. <laughs> Well, we love hearing that. And I'm yeah. super excited also then to meet up with you at the makeover and, you know, introduce you to Ed, like the gang, like all 300 yeah. trainers, you know, but like, <laughs> but yeah, like I'm very excited for you to get that experience and yeah. And figure out why that show is the way that it is. Cause we, <laughs> I don't want to say we can't figure it out, but we're happy we have it yeah. lightning in a bottle. I don't know if we can do and it. And everyone now, so. is so excited to tell you their stories with their horse. So like tap on all the shoulders, ask them anything. Amazing. <laughs> um, it really is the friendliest horse show I've ever been to. Oh, I really can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Annie, is there a place where people can kind of like follow your like physical journey around the U S or, you know, do you have a social media presence where you're kind of tracking what you're learning? I do. The name, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's not very snappy. Mm-hmm. It's called For the Love of All the Track Racehorses. So that's my Facebook page and my website and my Instagram. And I had been a bit slack, but I'm picking it up again now that I'm overseas. So I'll try to keep updating that as I go. Lovely. All right, cool. Well, we are going to come along for the ride for sure. And we will see you in a couple of weeks in Kentucky, which is very exciting. Yes. Cannot wait. Awesome. Well, safe travels, Annie. See you in a couple weeks. Thank you so much. Cashel has been crafting top-notch products since 1986, designed to make your ride safer, more convenient, and downright enjoyable. From the Crusader Fly Mask, the ultimate fly mask, trusted by riders nationwide, to the Blanket Top Performance Felt Pad with Pressed Felt with Merino Fleece, it's like a spa day for your horse's back, to the beautiful beaded halters, adjustable, durable, and gorgeous. Visit CashelCompany.com today and gear up for the ride of a lifetime. Cashel, where quality meets the saddle. Well, Joy, we are back. We are getting near the end of our series. And it's one of those times where I always like reflect a little sadly because we've gotten to know our Make the Makeover 
trainers so well this summer and spring and winter, and it's going to be sad to part with them. But fortunately, we don't have to say goodbye yet. We have one more episode, actually two more episodes, but we have a great conversation ahead, I am sure, with Dana, who is here with, well, not with, but you have John's Buckeye Bad Boy, which I just like to say every time I get the opportunity, because that's a great name. So welcome back, Dana. Oh, thank you. Yeah, obviously, uh, Buckeye is not here in the room with us at the moment. Or maybe he is. I don't know. But if he is, uh, he's, he's with us in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's that's probably plenty. <laughs> yeah. I've not tried to record in a room with a horse. I don't think that's a good idea. We should probably not do that. Well, so. No. Well, okay. Sorry. Yeah, we'll I'll... give it a try. We'll try it at the makeover. We'll just like camp in a stall and put a recorder up to his face and see what he has to say. So. So, yeah, we are in crunch time. And I know, you know, the some of the more recent episodes we've had, you were a little on the fence about what you were going to do with Buckeye and if you wanted to do the makeover again. And I was just casually scrolling social media the other day and happened to see a little listing for Buckeye. So what's what's the story there? What are you so doing? So I did go ahead and list him on some local OTTB and Ohio horse sites just to kind of gauge interest and see. And I feel like I'm... I'm all over the place. I'm kind of at a crossroads. I'm like, I want to do the makeover again, but also I really love Buckeye and he's such a good boy. And, you know, and, but my husband's like, he's a great boy, but you need to share him with someone else now. And selfishly, I'm like, but I really don't want to, I kind of want to keep him. But I did kind of just decided to gauge some interest. So posted him, got lots of responses some test rides and some offers on him. So. I am like in the in-between. I've not officially accepted any offers and, you know, just kind of deciding where to go. The That was out this morning, actually, because we had to get our health cert for going to Kentucky. And he asked, he was like, oh, you're keeping this horse, right? And my husband was just like the look around the room, like, we don't know what we're doing. (laughs) Yeah, well, and yeah, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer here, right? Like some of what your husband says is right. Some of what you say is right. Like like all of it's right. All of it's wrong. Like it really depends on where you are in the moment and like what you think about it. So yeah, unfortunately I cannot sit here and tell you what you should do. That That would be wonderful if I could just have a beacon be like, this is the (laughs) correct You should (laughs) do this. But yeah, like, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to every option, right? Like, you know, you, like your husband said, you know, share them with somebody else. And then that frees you up to get another one. And then there's also like, you could keep him and develop him and, you know, see what you can do in two, three, four years, you know? So yeah, there's, there's no wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. Only you know your truth. I feel like it's one of those magic eight balls when you shake it and it gives you an answer every time it's different. Yeah. At the makeover, just shake me and see what I say. I might have a different I might have to do it multiple times a day though, because I'm sure my head's going to be like ping ponging. I will tell you by the end of the day, if you have shaken me several times, my response might not be as nice. So oh, I am fair. curious yeah. how many that's people fair. use the magic eight ball these days to make their like horse decisions, because honestly, the math maths to me. <laughs> I mean, it's legit. I'm I might have to get on Amazon and purchase one. I need guidance. I, need, I may be it. looking into it right now. Don't judge me. I mean, there's always the coin flip method. Like, that's free. (laughs) I feel like the coin flip method is very black and white, though. It's a yes or no. There's no, like, thought-provoking, you know. What about, uh, just to add more elements to your gray area, what about a lease scenario? Mm. Leases make me really nervous. Yeah, me too. That's so (laughs) fair. fair. (laughs) Um, I feel like... Everybody is everybody had that has a horse. They're like, you know, people and every it's it's such a loaded topic that I'm like, I have leased horses before and I have had wonderful experiences. I did lease one of our thoroughbreds before to a wonderful 4 H girl that I was actually one of his connections from the track's daughter. So I knew he was gonna be well taken care of while he was in her hands. But it's always like, you know, you just you just never know. And it just makes me nervous. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Well, we can scratch that one off the list. Yeah. Again, though, we can, uh, I don't know that Joy and I can help you with this one, but it's interesting. You know, it, it is always interesting that we've had a very introspective episode. We've been talking a lot mm-hmm. about like being at a crossroads and not knowing what the right answer is. And 
I usually comfort myself by like the thing that's supposed to happen will happen. You just don't know what it is yet. So just, you know, hang tight, keep living your life and see what happens. I think everything will fall into place. And part, I guess part of my mind, I'm like, I'm going to like, maybe this weekend we'll concrete it one way or the other. Like, let's see how he does. He was, you know, it's been a little bit since he's been at a show. We went on some trail rides in the meantime. Like maybe that'll give me some clarity. Like when we go to the show this weekend, but then I have a mom that's like right in her due window. So we might not make it to the show this weekend. So yeah, that's right. (laughs) So I guess that's not going to give me any clarity either. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just further confuse the issue. Well, okay, so let's let's get into another deep question. So if there's a possibility you might do the makeover again, what would you choose to do differently? I mean, that's a pretty deep question, Chris. I'm going to interrupt for a second. And I think it's a good one. But I also am like, let's get through the makeover first. A that's better- true. Yeah, there's yeah. still time too to like switch it up and have so much can change. So. No, that answer could change in the next couple of weeks. All right, fine. I will save that until after the makeover. <laughs> yes, but that's I'm, a great after the makeover question. <laughs> but I am curious. So you got accepted earlier this year, back in January, February time. What about this journey? You probably had a picture of how it was going to go. We're so close to being there. Has it gone to your expectations? Have do you feel like you've grown from this journey or went totally off the road somewhere else than what you thought it was going to be? So I 100% have grown so much during this last nine months of retraining and working with Buckeye. I would say the biggest thing when I like bright eyed and bushy tailed at the beginning of this, like going in with no idea what to expect. If I could go back and tell myself now, it would be, you just got to be able to go with the flow. And which, I mean, we're nothing like really rocked every, all expectations and everything, but it certainly was a lot more ups and downs than I realized. Because like when he was doing amazing, you felt like you're on top of the world and you're like, oh man, we mastered that in one ride. And then the next ride, you're back to like, man, have you been ridden at all? Like, where, <laughs> where is your mind? So it was definitely not a linear experience of training. It was highs and lows that you just was not prepared for. I think that's such an important thing to touch on. Because I feel like the makeover gets really romanticized, Kristen, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it is this, you've never done it before. It's this really romantic idea of, coming in, riding, hopefully in like the Rolex arena, just being at the Kentucky horse park. And you're going to have this amazing, perfect experience growing with the horse. And I think you get all that besides perfect. I think there's a different definition of what perfect actually means in that space of it is very up and down. And I would say it's like a lot of grit to do what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, thinking back to our previous conversation we just had with Annie, I think that might be what has made the community of the makeover so special is that, you know, like the veterans kind of like paved the way for the first timers, you know, and they're like, there's going to be setbacks, you know, and we're all here to celebrate those alongside. Like, you know, Dana, you've been in that trainer group now, you know, all year. So, you know, you say that's that's kind of the vibe. Like everyone's like, oh my God, I forgot how to ride. And everyone's like, it's going to be okay. (laughs) One hundred percent. Yes. Yes. And I feel like as we get, I, you know, I feel like my mind maybe is a little bit fuzzy in details, but I feel like somewhere along the line, someone told me like that ride IQ, like the 30 days, like getting your horse going under saddle and like letting down off the track. They're like, do it at the beginning. And then right before the makeover. But maybe I made that up. I don't know. So like 30 days before, like Buckeye, I felt like we were kind of hitting a wall and maybe we just needed to go back to basics a little bit. So we restarted like that 30 day guided rides and started prioritizing doing hacks off property more too, some trail riding for some downtime and just letting him enjoy the rides. Even though we we felt like our rides were getting shorter and we were getting more accomplished, but he was like, I don't know, a little bored. So we kind of went back to basics and made sure we were incorporating those hacks and letting him just 
ride on the buckle and do what Buckeye wants to do and still keep him. So he enjoys what I'm asking him to do. And he certainly, like he does. He's, he just had a moment where he was like, again, we're doing this again, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's key. And I think I probably did something pretty similar with like, I was trying to just, I don't even know what I was trying to accomplish, but I was just like, I have to do flat work every single day with Jobber and the lead up to the 2018 makeover. And like, burned myself out, burned the horse out a little, like, you know, cause you just, you don't know any better. And you're like, I gotta, I gotta get this done, you know? And that's, yeah. Yeah. More hacks, less drills. Yes. That's, that's where we've been at for like this last, these last couple weekends. We do have two more shows prior to the makeover and then a down weekend where we'll just hack around the property not even haul off property, just, you know, before the trailer ride down to Kentucky. Nice. How long is your trailer ride down? Well, map quests or not map quests. That's not a thing anymore. But Google Maps says like five hours and 45 minutes, I think. That's not bad. Yeah. You just dated mm-hmm. all of us because I was like, oh, yeah, map quest. Yeah. <laughs> I said that to my daughter the other day and she was like, map what? And I was like, map quest. <laughs> Never mind. These Google kids Maps. and their <laughs> kids and their apps. Yeah. Yeah, I still remember navigating with a trailer in residential neighborhoods and like printed off paper directions, like not fun. So yeah, like flipping pages and like, where am I? <laughs> you're like, oh my God, ah, uh, you know, your co-pilot's like, just drive. You're like, where? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. We have the dead end cold things. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, GPS. I've totally done that with like a full size trailer on being like, how do I turn around? This is awesome. Yep. <laughs> oh boy, I love that. Well, that's pretty good stuff. Like, you know, I you've hit on you know, things that I think will, the yeah, right. Like that's the thing, right. I was about to say this and then I was like, no, this is stupid to even say this out loud, but like, oh, things that you're like, oh, for the next one, this is going to be so much easier. And then that horse will be completely different. And you'll be like, oh my God, start over again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, Back to the drawing board. Yep. But yeah, at least you found what works well for your horse. And now you're going to be sailing into Kentucky in perfect shape. I'm saying it now, I putting it out in the world. It's going to manifest that and we will be there in perfect shape. He might be in bubble wrap for the next, you know, couple of weeks until we get on the trailer to Kentucky, but. Yeah, just we'll tape make- all those shoes on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dana, remind us where listeners can follow your journey. I have not been great at updating it in probably months, but sometimes I post on TikTok at Buckeye Birth. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, give us like a one more pre-makeover video on there to keep the people happy. We'll be good to go. <laughs> Dana, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you in Kentucky in a couple of weeks. Can't wait to see you ladies in person. Love it. Kristen, I'm sure there's a lot on your plate as you are getting closer to the Thoroughbred Makeover, but how can other people get involved to make your life just a little bit easier? Yes, I would love that. Not too much that I can do for people like myself. Like I don't want to dump all my press releases and social media posts on anyone else. But if you do want to come to the makeover and hang out and experience what people have called the happiest horse show on earth, we are always looking for volunteers to help fill positions there. We have volunteer jobs for people who go to horse shows. We have volunteer jobs for people who don't go to horse shows. We have Jobs for like dads and brothers who don't know what they're doing. Like we literally, there's a a volunteer task for all comers. So if you would like to get involved with that, if you are planning to go to the Thoroughbred Makeover, you can just walk right up to the volunteer booth in the covered arena and say, hi, I'm here to help and we'll find something for you to do. If you are planning a trip and you know you'd like to volunteer now, thank you in advance, head over to therrp.org slash volunteerism and get signed up today. Well, it is that time of the show that everyone loves. It is where we enable you and tempt you with fabulous horses from the New Vocations Adoption Program. And today we have Amanda Jane coming on. Welcome back, Amanda. Hey, it's great to be back. It's good to have you. And I just called you by your middle name, Amanda Tucker. It is also... (laughs) Either one. (laughs) Yes. For listeners, we pre-record and it is 4.30. My brain's slightly mushy. So hang with us. We're going to keep it good. And they're here for the horse. They're not really here for me. But speaking of great things with horses, tell us what's new at New Vocations. We're getting close to the makeover, which means we're celebrating all things thoroughbred. Keeneland sales are kicking off. What's going on at New Vocations in October? Yeah, we've been super busy out here. We have had a bunch of horses adopt. We had five leave today. 
And I think we had four leave yesterday. So it's just been kind of crazy around here. Everyone's getting ready and gearing up thinking about 2025 already. I love that. And speaking of 2025, are there going to be any adoption specials happening in October? Yes, there are. We are going to be doing a $500 off adoption special for all the horses that are RRP eligible for 2025. So we'll be running that, I believe, starting two weeks before RRP and running just through the end. Awesome. So listeners, this is out on the 25th. If you're catching it, this is the time if you're thinking about doing the RRP, maybe this is your second, third, fourth time doing it. If you're Chris, been doing it since you came out of the womb and you're looking for your next horse, this is a time to search for them at New Vocations. I'll definitely help carry you. And I think you're also running an event too that Friday, correct? Correct. We are going to have an open barn on that Friday. We're still hashing out the details, but we'll get all that posted soon. But we're going to do an open barn. We're going to do a tour. And then all of our eligible horses will have out on display. So we'll be scheduling ride times so everyone can come see them under saddle. Wonderful. I think that'll be super fun. So details to come, we'll also post it on our social channels too, so that listeners don't miss out on that opportunity. I'm excited Um, to see everyone fight for their favorite horse there. (laughs) (laughs) Like makeover trainer (laughs) deathmatch. Like I want that one. No, I want that one. So yeah, that's gonna be great. Yes. Also catch that on video. We want to put that on our socials as well. Nothing is better than seeing, you know, horses fought over. Gosh, their egos. I wonder what a horse is really thinking when that happens. I digress. Before we (laughs) jump into our adoptable horse, I would love to pick your brain on a very sensitive topic for some people. This is definitely almost in the same realm of politics or religion. And that is what is some of like your favorite bits? What do you like to use for the green beans coming in or the, the types of bits that you like to gravitate to? Yes, absolutely. I think everyone has some opinions on this one. So it can get a little tricky, especially on Facebook. (laughs) But I like to keep it super simple with these guys when we're getting them straight off of the track. And then we really only, and generally I'm only getting about 10 to 15 rides on these guys before they're going on to their next person. So I generally start with just a regular double jointed, really friendly snaffle. Mm -hmm. That's my go-to. And most of them do really great in that. Some of them can get a little fussy. So my absolute favorite bit that I like to put them in after that is a Mylar. That's what all of my my horses that have been going under saddle for a while, they're all in Mylars. And I just just love them. They just seem super comfortable in those. They give them a little bit of tongue relief and they're super stable in their mouth. And that's always been a a big winner for me. And the other one that I, I go to that I use a lot, and I actually put a couple of horses in this week, it's just like a rubber nace. Mm. It kind of shocked me when I got into aftercare thinking these guys are going to be so strong and you need super strong bit. But it's actually been the complete opposite in my experience, like having something really soft and friendly. I just took a horse out cross country in a, in a nace and he loved it. So- yeah, I am a huge fan of the rubber nace. Like I was surprised, especially my lovely thoroughbred has a history of bolting we've since like controlled that over the years but when I first got her that was her thing and I'm thinking I'm going to need a more you know a stronger bit for control and it was Elisa Wallace who had recommended trying a a nath bit and I was like okay I don't really know so there's no brakes on here but I was pleasantly (laughs) surprised and we're still riding in it today and she's super soft in my hand I was like okay seems suspicious but yeah i love yeah. that like almost it's it's not actually reverse psychology but like it is for the person's sake and yeah. i know i've put this like on our social media takeovers on the podcast social media but like the hotter my horse the milder the bit mm-hmm. that i yes. choose because i otherwise like i box him in and he has no place left to go but up <laughs> so i'm like oh no no forward <laughs> like i don't care if we're going <laughs> forward fast but forward's good up no good so yeah i always i'm like no 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 like you know, if he's spicy, like, yes, we do use the double jointed loose ring and we just, you know, say a little prayer. Yes. I yes. feel like your quote could be a bumper sticker, by the way, Kristen. Which one? <laughs> the hotter the horse, the milder the bit. Yeah, we should put that Love on a that. t-shirt. Yeah, yes. we, should, we should get on that. <laughs> TM, 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 TM. That's nice. Yes. Royalties can be sent too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a great, like, probably the general ones we typically see. So it makes me feel good that 
we're probably following best practices at new vocations. Your horses always come out so lovely. And I feel like you do a good job of matching you know, the right horse, the right person, but obviously getting a chance to pilot what type of tack they like and guide that ahead of time when um, giving them to adopters probably takes a lot of that questioning out of the equation for new adopters. Yeah, absolutely. We send every horse home with a little sheet and it says what they're getting fed and what blanket size they have. And then I always put in there like what bed I've been riding them in successfully here so that they can kind of have a starting point when they when they get them home. Oh, that is the dream. I wish they all came that way. It's not always <laughs> right? the case. Exactly why people need to become approved adopters. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into our adoptable horse. I know you said you're out of stock currently at the Lexington facility. So yeah. where, where are we looking at today? So we are actually looking just a little bit north at our facility up in Ohio. We have a really cool dude out there called Ranger Fox. Oh, he's so handsome. Isn't he? Like, I am shocked that he is still up there. I was talking with his trainer, Brittany, and she is also stumped on why he's still there. He is just, she said he's just the perfect gentleman. He's the one that he turns all the new wild ones out with, and he's just so chill. She started popping him over some little cross rails. She's got some videos of him jumping over some cross rails, and he's just taking to everything like a duck to water. I love it. He's one of those unicorn ones where he's just like very chill, relaxed at the end of the day. But he's a classic bay, which I feel like a lot of people like to have. One, it's just if you want to buy any horse merchandise that looks like your horse, the bay is where it's at. That's yes, you have that. But also he's like still regal. He's got really nice dapples, really nice seal points. He's it looks like he's well bred built. too. Yeah, I see he's, he's a like, Nyquist. So, you know, that's a yeah. der- derby Mode, winning sire. Quality yeah. Road. yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are really nice sport lines, actually. So I know the Uncle Moe's are popular and they love the quality roads in the Hunter Ring. So yeah. That's exactly yeah, what I was thinking too, is Hunter Ring for this horse. Yeah. Or yeah, dressage. Little to potential. Very cool. Well, it's nice kind of seeing a different facility. There's a lovely video of him trying some cross rails and he just looks like a really willing dude, which is super cool. And probably what most people are looking for at the end of the day. So he is part of the $500 off adoption special. It's currently happening through September for the rehabbed and remarkable horses. So, Hey, there's just lots of specials across the board. I love what you're doing over here at new vocations. And that makes him the very outrageous adoptable price of $2,000. Mm-hmm. Like, this horse looks like he'd be, if you got him from anywhere else, it'd be significantly higher. So this is a steal and he gets checked and you get the fancy cheat sheet of how to take care of him and all of his needs. That's a bargain. We love what you're doing at New Vocations and that you always put these horses first. Everyone go to horseadoption.com. Check out Ranger Fox at the Ohio facility. And if you're looking and not quite sure what horse is right for you, Amanda can definitely be there to help you. Definitely. Thanks again for coming on the show. We always appreciate it. Anytime. For first time horse owners and new riders, finding the information and support you need can be challenging. That's why Equine Network has partnered with Sentinel and Absorbing to bring you My New Horse. From important horse keeping information and how to videos to social media communities, exclusive experiences, and more, My New Horse is your one stop shop for riders of all levels and disciplines looking for easy to understand horse care information and guidance. Start your horse ownership journey today. Visit mynewhorse.com. Joy, that was a fun episode. Like, we got into some like pretty heavy duty conversations, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope listeners did too. Listeners, let us know what you thought of this episode. Drop us a line on social media or shoot us an email. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website at horseradionetwork.com. Like us on Facebook and Instagram, just search for Retired Racehorse Radio. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. You can find me on Instagram at The Horseback Writer and on Facebook at Jobber Bill Racehorse to Ranch Horse. My email is Kristen at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me on Instagram at MissFitMare and my email is Joy at horseradionetwork.com. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products, Cashel Company, My New Horse, and to our partners, New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program and the Retired Racehorse Project. Don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network, part of Equine Network at horseradionetwork.com. Also, we don't ask this as much as we should, but if you love our show, please 
subscribe and make sure you're getting the downloads on any of your podcast players. And we love if you have a chance to rate us. The higher the ratings we get, the higher chance someone else will find us, which means we can do more episodes. And that goes the same for any of the other shows on Horse Radio Network that you love. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride and cow side leg. Bye, guys. Thank you.